I had no job Traveling around the country in my old car And someone crashed into me Almost killed me right then and there Docs put a tube down my throat Forcing me to breathe again they attached an electronic gizmo to my head to keep and monitor my brain. They, they fed me by shoving a tube through my skin directly to my stomach. I had to relearn how to walk and talk and eat. After I finally got free, I reached out to anyone. I lost most everything. I was only searching for love. And then, because Alex was going to be here, I thought I'm going to pull up something so it sounds fun and just to make something fun and different. Even though he's not here, you guys get to hear it. Um, this is something that I read at what was the radio show? Word Slingers. It's been so long, but I've never read it here before, so I hope you find this funny. This is Childhood Memories, number one. I was in the basement, the playroom. That's where all my toys were, you see. And I had just run in there, away from my family, who were sitting in the living room, after I said, I hate you! Now, I've never said that before in my family, nor would I ever say it again. I know better. I had run into that playroom, slammed the door shut. I couldn't have been more than five. And I ran in and I looked for things to put in front of the door so that they couldn't open it and find me. I took one of my chairs from my little play set and dragged it over to the door. Then I looked at the little schoolhouse for Fisher Price toys. The side opened up, it even had a blackboard and everything. I, I took that little schoolhouse, put it on that chair so that they were guarding the door, patiently obeying my orders. I was running around looking for something else I could carry to the door when I heard the doorknob turn. And my sister, with one arm, opened that door, pushing all my toys away. I knew I had been defeated. Get me the book Ouvre, which is not a perverted word. It means something like the collective works of taken as a whole, you know, a collection of works, and that's what that is. So, um, I thought I'd read some things from this, and I'm just, I'm just gonna just, I just started bookmarking things. So I'm going to start, what is this up here? Oh, I'm gonna start with this one. The ones that I don't often read, this is a piece called Medication. I set my alarm for 4.30 instead of 5.30, so I could roll over, take a pill, and then fall back asleep. I leave two pills on the nightstand with a glass of water every night. I could feel the pain in my leg, my hand, when I reached over to take the drugs. I'd feel it in my back, too, and sometimes in my shoulder. The water always tasted warm and dusty. It hurt to hold the pills in my right hand. I closed my eyes at 4.32. I hated that damn alarm clock. And taking the pills early still didn't help me with the pain any longer, make that pain go away before I woke up. I knew that, but I took them anyway. And I tried to fall back asleep, and I dreaded 5.30 when I'd have to move. At 5.40, I couldn't wait any longer. I couldn't be late. We couldn't have that. And so I'd finally swing my legs to the floor. I'd put on my robe and limp into the kitchen. The trip to the kitchen lasted for hours. And picking up the carton of milk from the fridge hurt like hell. This wasn't supposed to be happening. Not to me. Just pour the damn milk. I wipe the tears from my chin and sit down for breakfast. 
And the doctor doubled the dosage, and he was amazed that I needed to take this much. He told me to follow the directions strictly, strictly. You can't take these in the morning the way you have been, he said. They have to be taken with food. But that doesn't help when I'm crying from the pain in the morning. But I can get an ulcer, he'd say. And I wouldn't want that. Of course not. I just wanted the pain to go away. Take one tablet three times daily with meals. Do not drink alcohol while on medication. Take with food or milk. Do not skip medication. Do not take aspirin while using this product. Do not operate heavy machinery. May cause ulcers. All I had to do was get through the mornings. The mornings were the hardest part. Just take a little more pain and by the afternoon it will all be fine. Just fine. An hour after the pills, I'd start to feel dizzy. I'd stare at a computer screen, and it would move in circles back and forth. I wanted to grab that screen and make it stay in place, but then I'd look at my fingers, and they would go in and out of focus. I'd feel my head rocking back and forth, forward and backward. I, I couldn't hold myself still. I'd sit at my desk and my eyes would open and close, open and close. Before I knew it, ten minutes passed and I remembered nothing. I could have been screaming for ten minutes straight and I wouldn't have known it. Or crying, or sleeping, or laughing, or dying. I had just lost ten minutes of my life. Those were just taken from me, ripped away from me, and I could never get them back. And I could still feel the traces of the pain lingering in my bones. I'd sit up at night and stare at that bottle. It was a big bottle, as if the doctors knew I'd be taking these drugs forever. Hadn't it been forever already? I'd open the bottle, look at a pill. They looked big, too. Pink and white. What pretty colors. And then I'd think, if one tablet 50 milligrams could put me to sleep in the morning, could make me dizzy, could take away a part of my life from me, then think of what the other 36 could do. 1,800 milligrams. It could kill me. But I wouldn't want that. Of course not. I just wanted the pain to go away. But just think, the bottle isn't even full. May cause ulcers, may cause dizziness, side effects may vary for each patient. May cause weight gain, may cause weight loss, may cause drowsiness, may cause irritability. Medication may have to be taken consistently for weeks before expected results. If effects become severe, consult physician immediately. I began to count. In the mornings, I took eight pills. One multivitamin, one calcium pill, one niacin pill, one fish oil capsule, one garlic oil pill, one pink and white painkiller that I was special to have because you needed a doctor's permission to take those. Then I took diet pills, one starch blocker, one that was called a fat magnet, as if the diet pills worked anyway. But still, I took them. And then I'd have to watch the clock. And I'd take a pink and white at 1 in the afternoon, a different pill at 5 o'clock, another pink and white at 6 o'clock. And then there was usually the sinus medications that I had to take every 6 hours in there too. Or was it 8 hours? I can't remember. I started to watch the clock all the time. I bought a pill container for my purse so that I would always have my medication with me. When I'd feel my body start to ache again, I'd look at the clock. It would be another 15 minutes before I had to take another pill. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sorry. That's been a long time since I've read that one. And I was thinking of this. Yesterday, um, not only was Lincoln's birthday, um, but it was also Darwin's birthday. And uh, combined with Tomorrow being Valentine's Day, I wanted to say that I love my husband very, very, very much. Oh. No, I do. And, and because he had a question about this, when he was first trying to understand the concept of poetry, I had to read this poem called New to Chicago. I'm still new to this city. 
I know, I know, I've been here for years, but I haven't gone to the Sears Tower Observatory since my junior prom. But when I walk by the first Chicago building with those beams along that north side sloping up, parabolic pillars curving up toward the sky, when I walk by that first Chicago building, I walk up along the side and lean up against one of those sloping pillars, press my body against the cold concrete, feel the cold against my chin, my breasts, my thighs, and look up along that curve, stretching up toward the sky. You know, those pillars look like race tracks and I could see something come rushing down that curve uh, a matchbox car a race car a marble a bowling ball a two ton weight I see the speed the power and it almost makes me afraid to look up and every time I walk by that first Chicago building I do the same thing I do this little ritual and it feels like the first time. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a poem that I hope you like. It is called Death is a Dog. Death is an untrained little bitch. It pees on the carpet and it barks through the night and it's always begging for scraps at the table, seeing what it can take from you when you've got your back turned, when you're not looking. And when you want it to heal, well, it never does. And it never rolls over. And it never plays dead. I know what it takes to die. It's not an emotional, rash decision. It's cold. It's calculated. It's a numbing void. But one day, it suddenly all makes sense. And from that moment on, you either look for it, or it looks for you. Death is an untrained little bitch, I tell you. And I've been begging for it. But it never comes when you call. I leave a bottle of water and a bottle of dried dog food out, and you know, I never see it eating. But when I check, the bowl is empty. And I still refill the bowl. And vacuum the dog hair that sticks to the couch and spray the air freshener in the living room, because no matter how hard you try, you can never get rid of the smell. Death is an untrained little bitch, I tell you. And what it boils down to is this. You won't get along with her, and she won't get along with you. She'll claim her territory under the bed, eating your slipper while you try to sleep, and remind yourself that there are no monsters waiting for you to shut your eyes. I'm going to read this poem, and I'm reading it because Esteban Cologne really, really liked this poem, so I just want to end on this one. This is, oh, by the way, for people who heard that um, I know what it takes to die is a cold, calculated decision, I think I wrote this poem eight days before I was almost killed in a car accident, which is so scary spooky that I happened to write that then, but, um, but nobody knows these things, but fine. This is a poem, the ending one for me, I'm, I'll be done. This is called Fantastic Car Crash. And our life is one big road trip now. And we set the cruise control and make our way down the expressway. And most of the time we're just moving in a straight line. And the scenery blurs. There's nothing to see. But I know it's inside of you and I know what you're made of. There's no such thing as a calm with you. You are a fantastic car crash. You stop traffic in both directions as the gapers gawk and the delay grows as they all slow down and stare. Everything shatters with you, you know. It's a spectacular explosion. I, I try to duck and cover as metal flies through the air. And every time you leave the scene of the accident, I am left picking up the shards of glass from the windows 
You know, the glass breaks into such tiny little pieces. They look like ice. It takes so long to pick up the pieces. And even though I'm careful, I'm still picking up the pieces. And I'm still on my knees. <laughs> and the glass cuts into my hands and the blood drips down to the street. Think of it as my contribution to this fantastic car crash that is you, that is me, that is us. As I wipe the blood from my hands and wave my hand to the line of traffic. Go on ahead. Keep driving. This happens all the time. There's nothing to see here. <laughs>